Where are we going this morning? I want to go take her. Thank you. If you remember a few weeks ago, I, I was uh, speaking on a Sunday morning, and I went to uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 4, and spoke about the encounter between Jesus and, the, and Peter and some other fishermen. And in that encounter, Jesus issues an invitation to the fishermen to put out into deep water. And then he calls them to be his disciples. And at the end of that message, some of you stood up and responded and said, you wanted to go deeper with God. I can't remember who of you it was now, but I'm sure some of you did. What happened to Peter after that time with Jesus? What happened to him in the weeks and months and years after that invitation and that call that Jesus made on that morning. And what has happened to you and to me since we responded and said, we want to go into deep water with you. We want to go deeper with you. Going deeper with God is not a one-off experience. It's a lifetime of commitment. The call was the beginning for Peter and the other fishermen. As it is for us, when we hear Jesus calling our name, when we hear him speaking, Nigel, Nigel, I want to know you. As he did some 40 years ago for me. That's the beginning. And then God calls us, calls me, to go deeper with him. Are you ready? Are you ready to go deeper? That's the title of the message this morning, by the way. Jesus' words, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. That's the beginning. Now, when I started thinking about this, I, I had some first thoughts. And you know, Sometimes first thoughts can be great, can't they? They're often intuitive and instinctive responses. They often relate to a particular complicated situation. But you know, sometimes first thoughts can also be misleading and dangerous. My first thoughts when I hear the call to go deeper are something like this. Yes, God, what do you want me to do? Anyone relate to that? And anyone thinking, that's what I would have thought. What do you want me to do? Well, that's not always the best question to ask. I like Peter. I like reading about him in the Gospels. I like his character. I like what he did. I like what he became. But it has to be said that he was a little bit impulsive as he went along with Jesus. You see, Peter was the one, when Jesus said that he needed to wash the disciples' feet, first of all, he said, no, 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 you're not washing my feet. And then when Jesus explained why he needed his feet washing, he said, well, wash all of me. He wasn't satisfied. He was the one who went to the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was betrayed and had the sword. And when Jesus was betrayed, he took it out and struck off the servant's ear. He was the one who, at the transfiguration, in that awesome time when Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus, said to them, shall I build you some shelters for, for you, Jesus, and for Moses and for Elijah? He hadn't got it. He was a bit impulsive. And if I'm honest, sometimes I can be like that too. Sometimes... I put my mouth into gear before I've engaged my brain. And that can be dangerous. And sometimes I'm discussing someone, something with someone, someone who's more intelligent than I am, and I can't think of the words to say. Sometimes 
someone asks for something and before I've even thought about what they're asking, I'm trying to do something to help them. Anyone else like that too? Yeah? You see, like Peter, we might need to undergo some training before we're ready for action. Our first thought might be, Lord, what can I do for you? But maybe there's some steps before we get there. I think in the army or in the air force or whatever, they call it boot camp. Is that right? No. What's they call it, Stacy? Basic, basic training. Basic training. Sorry. Where's, what's boot camp then? Where you get fit? American. Sorry. Okay. On films, where, they got in, where they're in the army, they call it boot camp. In Britain, they call it basic training. What does Christian basic training look like? Well, I've got a few things to say to you this morning. The first thing I want to do is to go back seven days. I want to go back seven days to last Sunday morning to someone who, once, who said, what are the marks of a true Christian? That's part of basic training, realizing that. Luke 6, 32, second half. For even sinners love those who love them. You might remember Charles saying that last Sunday morning. It might have stirred something up in you. Now, I'm not going to repeat Charles' sermon. You can listen to it again if you want to. It's on, uh, on, on access through the website. But Charles began by speaking about genuine love. And then he gave us some challenges that Jesus gave us. He said, we are to love and pray for our enemies. We are to turn the other cheek. We are to treat our enemies as, they wish to be, as, as you wish to be treated. And as, uh, during the week, I was thinking about that and thinking, well, that's really, really hard. How can I? Ha uh, Harley finds it really hard. I find it really hard. And so I thought it would be good to give you an example of someone who has accomplished this. And there's a testimony on one of the Alpha videos, which, I'm go which Paul's going to put on in a, in a minute. And it speaks about forgiveness of enemies. And I'll give you a slight warning here. It speaks of some quite hard situations. But let's have a re uh, listen to this testimony. It's just a couple of minutes long. My name is Bertie Emmanuel, and I participated in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I murdered many Tutsi under the order of bad leadership, and I've spent six years in prison and four years in community service. While in prison, fellow prisoners invited me to try Alpha. I went, but struggled to engage. I realized I needed to tell the truth about what I had done and wrote a letter asking for forgiveness of the relatives of those I had murdered. Life was so hard after being released from prison. I found my wife with two children that were not mine and I faced many heartbreaking situations. I didn't know how I was going to live with the genocide survivors after what I had done. My heart was filled with agony, loneliness and fear. Encouraged by Alpha in prison, I decided to do Alpha again. I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I had never known before. With the help of a local pastor, I went to find Vincent, whose mother and grandmother I had killed, to ask for forgiveness. I now live in a village built for genocide survivors 
and perpetrators. Vincent lives in the same village. We have formed a friendship and I now experience peace like I haven't experienced it before. Day-to-day -day life continues to be a challenge, but I have found forgiveness and healing for the things that I've done. That's the baseline. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus forgives us so we can forgive others. Next thing. I normally leave the, the sort of uh, emotional story till later on in the sermon, so I thought this time we'd get it out of the way early on and uh, then you've got time to recover before the end. Point two, be transformed. Be transformed. Before we want to start doing things, before we want to start starting a ministry, before we want to do all the things that God is asking us to do, we need to start being transformed. Paul writes to the Roman church in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and he says, Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is what is good and acceptable and perfect what's all that about what is being transformed for us Holy Spirit at work in us that's right Robert work at work in different areas of our lives what about our thought patterns all of us come to christ with baggage don't we when we come we come with history we come with form as it were and yes jesus has dealt with all that on the cross but sometimes it takes us a while to catch up with what he's done because we need to live it out and our thought patterns need to be changed and renewed. What about our habits? You may say, well, I don't have any habits. <laughs> Is that a laugh because you have or you haven't, Carolyn? <laughs> I've got habits. I don't know what they are, but I've got them. What about our addictions? And I'm not just talking about the big ones, you know, alcohol and drugs and things like that. We've all got addictions in some areas. What about our emotional responses to people, to situations, to things that we come across? They need renewing. What about our self-image? Many people today have a very low self-image. They don't understand that they're made in the image of God. That they are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God knows everything about them. And, and before they were born, he formed them in their mother's womb. When we can grasp hold of that, we begin to realize who we are in God. And it begins to change how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about others. What about criticism? and judgment of ourselves and others. Sometimes we're so hard on ourselves, we need our minds renewing. And what about gossip? The enemy of a lot of churches. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says, So do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Didn't God say to us last Sunday morning about renewing the inner man? Renewing the inner woman? That's what he's doing amongst us. And as we are transformed, we are being made ready for the works that God has prepared for us. 
Ah, but hang on a minute. Not so fast. We're not there yet. We also need to seek the presence of God. The early church in Acts chapter 2 had it right. As it says in verses 42 through to 47, it says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. How do we seek the presence of God? In prayer. In prayer. When you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, when you go through your day, on Wednesday morning, when some of us gather at 7 o'clock till 8 o'clock, it's a great time as we meet to commit the day and the various things that God puts in our hearts in prayer to him. But not just prayer, the word. As we read our Bibles, as we listen to sermons, as we uh, discuss with one another, as we engage, as we argue, as we, as we find out what the word says, and as we hear what God is speaking to us through those things, as we break bread together, as we share communion around the table and remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, as we share fellowship together in small groups and here on a Sunday and down for coffee afterwards and all those other times, and as we're generous with one another, and as we see God's vision and God's provision for all the things that he wants us to do, we're being prepared by being in the presence of God. And we do this, as we, and as we do this, we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives in greater depth. And we go deeper with him, that he does his work in us. And you know the Holy Spirit is not like Alexa, is not like Siri. Not someone you can just say, Holy Spirit, what's the weather going to be like today? Wow, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Let's try another one. Holy Spirit, what am I to have for dinner today? Pizza. Pizza. <laughs> Holy Spirit, what am I to do with the rest of my life? Serve. Serve. That's a great one. Thanks, Debs. But... Sometimes the answers are more complicated than that, aren't they? Sometimes it takes us time to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Sometimes we need to draw aside and to pull back from things, to get to that point where we're ready even to listen and to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Because our minds have not been transformed enough. And there's still all those habits and passions and things and addictions that get in the way. And, and we, 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 we're not clear on what God is doing. But as we persevere, as we press in, as we go deeper with him, God reveals himself. And the Holy Spirit brings fruit in our lives. And the Holy Spirit pours gifts out to us. And then, maybe then... We get to do some things. That's the exciting bit, isn't it? Maybe we get to do some things. One of the most quoted verses in Scripture to Christians who are asking questions is this. 
Jeremiah 29, verse, verse 11 and 12. How many times has someone prayed this over you? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. We heard about that hope this morning, didn't we? God releases hope on his people. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. As we continue to show the marks of a true Christian, as described by Charles last week, as we continue to be transformed in our thinking and renewing of our minds, as we continue to seek God's presence, then maybe God will task us and equip us to do his work. Or maybe he won't. It may be soon or it may be later. What does God say in that promise in Jeremiah? When he says, I know the plans I have for you. The plans of God. He says his plans are to give us welfare. Some translations say prosper. God wants good for us, not evil. Plans to give you a future. Some of us come to God not knowing we have any future. And hope. And our response to those things that God promises is not to go and plant a church or to go and feed the poor or to go and look after widows and orphans. Our response is to be to come to him and pray. To seek him with all our heart and he will be found. He will restore. He will bring back. The context of that verse in Jeremiah is the people of Israel being brought back from exile. And our situation is and will be very different to that. But the principle remains. God's plan may not involve us doing anything. Now for some of us that's very hard to hear because we want to be action men, action women. We want to do things. We want to help God see people say, We want to be part of what God is doing. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Let me give you an example. One of the great heroes of faith in the Old Testament, and one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, is Abraham. Abraham was a great man, and he's cited through the Bible as a great man of faith. He's called a friend of God. What did God ask him to do in his life? What did God ask him to do? It was very simple. God said to him, leave home, go to a new place, have a family, settle down. That was all God asked him to do. And if you know you, the story of Abraham you'll know that that was an adventure enough to do just those things. Because it didn't all go smoothly, did it? Surely all of us can do that level of what God asks. But maybe it lasts more. Let's look at a New Testament example. This is from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Now there were in the church of Antioch, Prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a member of the court of, the Her of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to, which I have called them to. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now, different situation here. They're being called to do something. They're being called to go and do the work that God has called them to. Ah, 
Notice this. Remember these things, though. They were operating within the context of a church. They weren't two individuals on their own sitting in their houses thinking, what does God want us to do? They were within the body of Christ. It was not their own idea. And within the body of Christ in Antioch, the ministries of God were operating. There were prophets, there were teachers, there were pastors. And the context of the call is that they were worshipping God. They were seeking the presence of God. And then, in that context, the Holy Spirit said, Do the work of God. Not their work, not their ministry. Do the work of God. And then they're sent out, not of their own accord, but by the church and the laying on of hands. So maybe there is something for us to do. Maybe God does have a job for you to do. You'll find it within the context of the church. You'll find it within the context of worship and God's people. So how do we approach doing these things that God calls us to? Well, there is no one who is disqualified from doing God's work. No one is disqualified. If you have faith in Jesus and are willing to be obedient to what he says, then God can use you. I want to give you a few tips this morning. These are my thoughts. They're not from Scripture. My thoughts. How to approach doing God's, God's work. Approach God's work with humility. I am not God's gift to save the world. Jesus is that. If I get an opportunity to share my faith, I can do it in humility. That's not the same as inability. Inability says, I can't do this. Inability says, this isn't me. Inability says, it's outside my comfort zone. Humility says, it may be difficult, but I'll do it. If you say so, God, I'll have a go. And maybe approach what God is asking to you to do with a little bit of reluctance. Don't rush in too quickly. Reluctance is not the same as refusal. Refusal is saying, no. No. Reluctance is saying, I'm not sure about this, but I'm going to take a step forward and see what God does. Reluct refusal is saying, someone else can do that. That's not for me. You do it. Simon, you do it. You, you, you get up here and preach. You know, it's, I'll, I'll, it's not for me. Reluctance is saying, I don't know what to say. God, what do I say? A thousand small decisions make a big difference. What do I mean by that? Well, I was thinking yesterday as we were chatting with, with, with friends. We've been, we will have been in this church next April 11 years. That's time flies, isn't it? Some of you have been here a lot longer than that. And if I allow a generous proportion for holidays, I reckon that I'll have listened to over 500 sermons in the time I've been here. 500 sermons. That's a lot of sermons, isn't it? How many of those sermons have completely changed my life? Probably not that many. Now, preachers, don't be discouraged by what I'm saying. Preaching is great. But those 500 sermons have drip-fed into my life the Word of God. Each of those has put something into my life 
which has changed me from what I was 10, 11 years ago to what I am now. You might not see a lot of change, but I think I have changed. You have changed. And those thousand small things that may have come through those 500 sermons make a big difference in the kingdom. Don't despise the day of small things. Here's another one. Look for God's timing in what he's asking you to do. Sometimes he lets you know in advance what he wants you to do later on. If you're like me or Charles, if he says, if someone says, oh, I think God's saying this, the next day it's, have you done it? I want to do things straight away. But sometimes I just need to hold back. Now I'm going to stop speaking some soon, but I want to finish with some quotes. Some of you will know you, a guy called Eugene Peterson. He uh, translated the Bible to a modern day translation called the Message. It's, a, it's a, a contemporary language translation. And I've been reading the Message in my devotions for some time now. I started at Genesis, I'm up to two Chronicles, I'm looking at Solomon. And then every now and then in, the div in this Bible, he, he, he has a little sort of nugget, as it were, of, of insight. And I was reading the other day about Solomon at the beginning of his reign as king of Israel. And Eugene Peterson talks about him in this reign. And he says about the balance between the inner life and the outer life of a man. And this is what he says about Solomon. The inner life of Solomon was in proportion to his outer life. How many of us can say that? His wisdom was as large as his wealth. His understanding as expansive as his empire. His heart as huge as his horse stalls. In him, the material world wasn't separated from the spiritual world, but was organically related to it. We see in Solomon's life a living out of the prayer that John prayed in regard to his friend Gaius. I pray for good fortune in everything you do and your good health, that your everyday affairs would prosper as well as your soul. 3 John one twenty one. What happens on the inside informs what's happened on the outside. What happens on the outside informs what happens on the inside. And as we go deep with God, there becomes more of a balance between those two things. Second quote. Those of you that use the Lectio 365 um, devotional app will recognize uh, some of these words about George Muller. If you don't know who George Muller, wa Muller was, he was uh, a guy who was born in Prussia uh, some years ago. He became a Christian at university and then he moved to England in 1829. He came to train for missionary work. And during his missionary ministry, he became increasingly concerned about the number of children orphaned and homeless because of the cholera epidemic in Bristol. And so he founded an orphanage. And then he founded three more orphanages. And each time he prayed for resources that he needed and got provided. And he continued to do that until the neighbors started to complain about the noise of all these children. Some people. In 1846, he prayed about starting a large orphanage in the countryside. He worked out that he needed £10,000 to do this. That's roughly equivalent to £1.4 million in today's money. And so he prayed. And as was his custom, he didn't tell anyone what his need was. He didn't put an advert saying, 
I need £10,000. He just came before God. And God provided. And God kept providing. So that by 1870, there were five large orphanages serving over 2,000 children. Later in life, he was asked what advice he would give to young believers. What advice he would give to young Christians. And this is what he said. He said three things. Firstly, be slow to take new steps in the Lord's service or in your business or in your families. Weigh everything well, all in the light of the Holy Scriptures and the fear of God. Secondly, seek to have no will of your own in order to ascertain the mind of God regarding any steps you propose taking, so that you can honestly say you are willing to do the will of God if he will only please to instruct you. Wow. Are we there yet? I don't think I am. Thirdly, but when you found out what God's what the will of God is, seek for his help. And seek it earnestly, perseveringly, patiently, believingly, expectantly. And you will surely, in his own time and way, obtain it. If we can reach out for those things we'll be in a much better place to hear what God is saying to us and to do what God is asking us to do. It really did touch me what you said today, and you're absolutely right. God had a plan for us when before we were born. Mm. You've got to remember that. Yeah. And obviously, um, I do know that before my Christian life, I've had a very hard upbringing. Mm. And also, I was involved in with the wrong crowd. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it because it's all forgotten. That's where my enemies are. Yes, you're right. We should forgive them. Now, what I do know in my Christian life, I know God is dangerous. Mm. I know that for a fact. True. Because he's put me in three different occasions in a corner that I ca had no else to turn. So that's when my transformation came in. Yeah. So I've changed my um, attitude. I've changed my way of thinking, um, the way I, you know what I mean. Now, it's hard to do it, to be fair. True. The question is, I've asked myself as a question, are you going to be a man or a mouse? So yeah. that's how I feel. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a matter of choice. Yeah. It's a matter of choice of, um, as a person, to, to decide what you really want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's glad, that, that is God's glory. Yeah. And he has given me everything what we have yeah. i don't i'm not a materialistic person we have three cars a lovely house and but yeah, god yeah. has given us what we want mm -hmm. but it's only if you submit to mm. god to say well it's going to be hard but the question is mm. are you going to be a man to do it absolutely or just be a mouse yeah and what harley said there is very important because god will put us into corners he will kettle us and close us in. But we always have free will. We always have choice. He doesn't leave us with no choice. We can choose to ignore him. We can choose to stay exactly as we are. We can choose to go in a different direction. We can choose to say, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to change that attitude. No, I don't want to give up that addiction. No, I don't want to do anything like that. There is free will. And that is important to grasp hold of. But, but, the choice is always better 
if we say yes, if we stand up and be a man, stand up and be a woman of God and say yes, though it is difficult, though I don't know where I'm going, though I can't see the future, though I am frightened, I will say yes. I'll stand up and say yes. Even if that causes me pain, even if that causes me to get out of my comfort zone, even if that causes me to, to be drawn out of what I want to be in. Yeah. What you're saying is, is great, and it's interesting. And this morning I read, I was reading the word for today, and it said, it said this, if I can read it, if that's okay. Yeah. It said um, about being all su- uh, getting all your sufficiency from God. And then it says, there's a syndrome called failure to launch. It's experienced by people who feel insecure about their future. They never seem to get to the place in life where they feel ready, so they miss out on opportunities. Life says, ready or not, ready or not here I come. Now, life's inevitability doesn't mean that preparation is trivial. It's important. But feeling ready is very overvalued. Yeah. We're called to walk by faith, yeah. not by sight. When God brought the Israelites into the promised land, he told them to step into the Jordan River first, after he parted the water. If they'd waited for evidence first, they would be waiting and to be on the banks. Mm. Faith grows when God says go, and you say yes. Mm. The truth is, you don't realize what you can do until you do it. Ready happens quicker if you're already moving. If you wait to move until you're completely ready, you will wait until you die. Jesus doesn't tell us, go, you're ready. He tells us, go, I will go with you. You will grow as you go. You develop as you do. So I just wanted to, just that's an... uh, really spoke to me yeah, this yeah. morning and it's very good like what you said but yeah. it's just kind of a yeah and I want to s- emphasize as well that I'm not saying this morning that we wait until we're all absolutely ready <laughs> um, you know as as we are being transformed as we are seeking the presence of God as we are being part of a worshiping community as we are exhibiting the marks of a, a Christian then God will work through us and he is. And he is. And I want you need to hear this. And he is. And he, is. he is working through you. Whatever you're doing during the week, he's working through you. And you may not think you've got there yet, but he's doing it anyway. And that's amazing. 